Hello, and welcome to our latest Money Show Money Masters podcast. I'm Mike Larson, Editor-in-Chief at Money Show, and today I'm speaking with Mike Green, Portfolio Manager and Chief Strategist at Simplify Asset Management. Welcome to the podcast, Mike. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. I do appreciate you taking some time out here. Um, I guess, you know, you talk a little bit about a little bit about every market out there. I know you're a macro guy who's involved in a lot of different places. But I want to start just by maybe you taking a minute out to, you know, give a bit of your background and simplifies and and talk a little bit about your firm's ETF lineup. Sure. So I've been doing this for probably longer than I should have, but uh, I got started in 1992 um and have managed everything from mutual funds to separate accounts to hedge funds um and have done everything from small cap value to macro and it's a, a function of just a, a career that tr that my trajectory moved from a valuation expert initially actually focusing in m a uh, and then transitioning to being focused on things like derivatives etc which uh lines up very well with my historical career uh, in 2020, the rules changed around yeah. ETFs, and so the SEC introduced what's called the derivative rule, which followed hot on the heels of another change in 2019 called, excitingly, the ETF rule. The ETF rule made it easier for new ETFs to be launched. The derivative rule created the rules around which we could include hedge fund type strategies in the ETFs. Yep. And so we recognize that the tax advantages of the ETF framework, as well as things like not having the K-1s that you would have with traditional partnerships, makes the ETF actually a better home for many hedge fund strategies for high net worth individuals or individuals who are looking to gain access to those diversified strategies. Um, we've been very fortunate. We launched in September 2020. We were basically pandemic babies. We're a truly virtual company with our employees spread all across the United States. A couple actually were international until very recently. Um, and uh, we've grown up to, we're just about three and a half billion dollars in assets under management now, um, which is nice from a standing start. But as I like to remind people, that's nothing in an industry in which uh, assets are occasionally measured in the trillions. Um, and our lineup includes everything ranging from fixed income uh, products like our credit high yield product, where we offer a credit hedge overlay on top of the high yield. That's actually performed quite well, outperforming benchmarks, despite the fact that we haven't seen much credit spread widening, and most of that outperformance has actually come during the brief periods of credit spread widening. So the strategy so far has worked really, really well. We also offer alternatives products, things like quantitative investment strategies that you may have heard referred to as portable alpha. We are we are the first ETF firm to offer those um, in a fund. And we also offer things like managed futures or trend following strategies that traditionally have not been available in ETF form, or if they have been available in ETF form, they've been what's called a replicator. They effectively have tried to fast follow the behavior of others in the industry. We were the first to actually design a product that could be traded in liquid environment where we were able to execute trades on a daily rebalancing basis. That product's been doing fantastically well. And so we're really pleased with the development of Simplify. And we encourage people to check out our website at www.simplify.us to learn more about us. Got it. Well, now your you know, main product, I guess, is what, the Simplify Macro Strategy ETF, FIG, if I'm not mistaken. Um, well, that's my asset allocation product. My my The product that I actually am directly managing in terms of the underlying components as compared to asset allocating is the credit high yield product okay. that I'd identified. But overall, yes, I, I focus my efforts on this idea of asset allocation. Okay. Well, let's talk, I mean, macro strategy, let's talk about some of the big picture things that are going on out there and sort of what you find interesting. I mean, the Fed's soaking up a lot of attention on Wall Street and heck on 60 Minutes for that matter. I mean, what are your thoughts on, on Powell and the outlook for interest rates here? I know you had talked a little bit about what the true inflation, you know, real-time inflation gauges are showing. So I'm kind of curious as your take there. Yeah, so I think this is a really interesting period. We have the US CPI or PCE data, which by construction is designed to smooth out inflationary metrics. So most people are not aware of this, but if you think about things like about 40% of the CPI is actually composed of a moving average of housing expenses, including things like rents, et cetera, or the rents that you believe or that would be identified associated with a property similar to yours. It's not a survey. I just want to be very clear on that. Um, those tend to create smoothed pictures. And as a result, they underreported inflation in 2021. They overreported inflation today. I realize that that makes people frustrated because they look at their grocery bill. They're like, it's not coming down. Mm -hmm. Remember that inflation is the change in the price level, not the not the absolute level of the price level. And so your milk is more expensive. Your cereal is more expensive. 
The question is, is it becoming more expensive at a more rapid rate or has it retreated to the type of low inflation that we experienced prior to the events of uh, the global pandemic? And the answer appears to be that we've largely retreated back. Real-time metrics, things that are not trying to engage in that smoothing behavior, products like Trueflation, which can be found at trueflation.com, will give you an indication of what real-time inflation looks like. That's suggesting we're back down below 2%, somewhere in the 1-4 range is what that appears to be. That meshes pretty well with the data that I'm seeing in terms of a, an immediate component. The problem, of course, is that if you have five and a half or five and a quarter percent interest rates and 1.4 percent inflation, you're actually running a really positive, really strong real rate uh, that unfortunately just doesn't really match up with the potential growth for the U.S. economy. Remember that the growth of an economy is a combination of the number of workers, the number of hours they each work and how productive they each are in those hours. The data that we're seeing suggests that the growth of workers is now fantastically low, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 basis points, or 0.2 to 0.3%. If we look at the hours that people work, those are actually falling. And if we look at the productivity or the amount that they're putting out per worker, we're not seeing that change in any market way. We've seen some catch up in the past couple of quarters. But overall, that suggests that we have relatively low growth potential for the U.S. economy. And that's largely matched by the data that we're seeing, where it's requiring explosive growth in government debt in order to push the economy to the levels of growth that we're currently seeing, about 3% year over year GDP levels. Um, you know, that just that that historically would suggest that you require much lower levels of interest rates. Mm -hmm. Um, and we'll see if that ends up being the case. The challenge right now is that after several years, like so literally a decade of very low interest rates, many entities in the markets had turned out their uh, debt exposure. So in other words, they're not subject to the short term forces of the Fed hiking interest rates. Yep. And so perversely, what we're seeing is a very slow burn where the U.S. government's interest rate expense rose fairly rapidly. As we saw new borrowing in the form of T-bills, et cetera, come through. Interestingly enough, many households are experiencing much higher interest rates on things like money market funds that's benefiting those who currently have capital. But what we've also seen is we've seen corporations and households that theoretically should be refinancing their debt, whether that's because they're moving into a larger home or moving to a new location to pursue employment. That would be a type of refinancing associated with the mortgage space. Um, or corporations in the high yield or investment grade space that are confronting the reality of much higher interest rates, they've delayed that refinancing. And so now we're actually looking at a maturity wall, right? The refinancing needs associated with high yield that are among the highest we've ever seen in history. And people forget that this is about 30% of the employment in the United States. It's tied to companies that are levered in one way or another. And so now we actually get to find out in the course of 2024, what happens when these companies try to refinance? And I got to tell you, unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of data that suggests it's not particularly positive. We're seeing yeah. the more distressed companies struggle to obtain refinancing. We're seeing a rise in bankruptcies. We're seeing a rise in corporate distress levels that you know is unfortunately that is not being matched by what we're seeing in terms of market pricing. But we're actually empirically observing this in the underlying data. And so it's an interesting crossroads that we're at to the markets begin to reprice to what we're seeing in the empirical experience. Or do the it does the empirical experience suggest that the wisdom of the crowds and market is the more likely outcome? I personally think that we're more likely to see a market disconnected from fundamentals at this point in time. I'm glad you brought that up because, I mean, the, the generally accepted narrative seems to be, OK, we skirted recession. It looks like we've got the, the Fed actually somehow managing a soft landing for the first time in forever. Um, would it be fair to say that you take the other side of that or how do you see things evolving over the course of this year? So I think that there are elements of that. I mean, any time that you are able to forestall a recession for an extended period of time, you see things like we just saw, which is purchasing orders or um, you know, sentiment amongst businesses that have allowed their inventories to be drawn down because they're concerned about things, you see that ultimately they are forced to go back into the market and buy stuff, right? And that's contributed to some of the rebound in the economic data that we've seen. In other areas, and, and I would address some that Jerome Powell very explicitly mentioned this, this weekend on 60 Minutes, as you highlighted, you know, the labor market, we're actually getting really disjointed data. I think this is important on a couple of fronts. One, 
because of the inflation and wage increases that we've seen, we haven't actually done things like adjust unemployment benefits to inflation levels. And as a result, the unemployment benefits have fallen in the real value dramatically. The state of California, where I owned a home most recently, I actually sold it and, and uh, I'm currently wandering the earth is kind of the <laughs> easiest way to describe my trajectory. Um, the state of California, the maximum unemployment benefits over the course of any 12 month period is about $11,000. That's 25% of the poverty level for a single individual in the state of California. Yeah. As a result, the rate of filing for things like unemployment claims is really low. It's about 25% of people who are currently unemployed in California are filing for unemployment claims. That's creating confusing data. The recent strong jobs report that we saw uh, was largely due to seasonal adjustment factors being reintroduced to reflect the fact that the pandemic basically screwed with all of the seasonal adjustment factors that we've historically had. And interestingly enough, if we look at that very strong employment report and we compare that with the household survey, which is done by asking individuals as compared to businesses, they actually are indicating that full-time employment fell in that. So we're now actually seeing this incredible dichotomy between falling uh, full-time unemployment, I'm sorry, falling full-time employment versus the uh, BLS telling us that payrolls are expanding at a relatively rapid rate in the past couple of months. Again, all the evidence suggests that the, the payroll data actually has some fundamental flaws in how it's constructed and how it behaves at these turning points. And where we have seen the actual adjustments, not a seasonal estimation type adjustment, even in this last report, we saw that pull lower. The first quarter of 2023, we saw 350,000 jobs taken out, even after all the downward revisions that we saw over the course of 2023. So we're not we're just dealing with some really uncertain information and i would caution people that like my biggest fear is is that the fed has basically hiked super aggressively after having not hiked at all or changed monetary policy in response to the initial waves of inflation and now we're just presuming it has no impact whatsoever which would be a a, a very strange outcome in history to say the least got it Let's uh, shift gears a little bit to some of the other topics you've weighed in on recently. Um, geopolitics, for example. I mean, U.S.-China relationship, how things are going there. Um, what would you offer on that front? I mean, do you think that that's going to be a big concern for, for investors moving forward as the year goes on? Well, I think, you know, it's been notable that there hasn't been contagion effectively, right? That we have seen the Chinese stock market and the Chinese economy, while ostensibly on headline numbers remaining very strong, we've actually seen really disappointing results in the data that we can actually track for China, things like commodity consumption, et cetera. Um, I, I would just caution China that, you know, we all walk into uh, various service establishments and see the sign that says the customer is always right. Right. And we are the customer as it relates to China and replacing China in the supply chain is actually proving to be relatively straightforward and relatively easy. We've outsourced or reshored to places like Mexico and Canada. We've moved production away from China into areas like India and Vietnam. Um, and we're, we seem to be doing that with relatively few disruptions. That's creating conditions for China that I think are quite challenging. It's forcing them to seek out partnerships in things like the BRICS, which is basically a group of autocratic regimes that don't want to actually follow, you know, traditional standards or what we would think of as Western standards. Yeah. Um, those entities are increasingly getting isolated. They're increasingly experiencing adverse events. And the United States is slowly pulling away just as it did against the Soviet Union, right? Central planning doesn't work. It doesn't work when we do it domestically. It doesn't work when we do it internationally or in, in foreign countries. It may briefly feel like you're getting something really fantastic accomplished, but you're failing to take into consideration all the information that's contained in prices or individual behavior. And as a result, we have just continued to separate in terms of economic performance. Yeah. Again, want to shift gears to another topic that was, was recently on your sub stack. Great work there. I do like to follow that. Um, Bitcoin and, and what's been going on in the crypto space. I mean, investors yeah. are paying attention again after a long period where uh, the, the, all this, this scandal and stuff was going on. You know, what are you thinking there? I mean, it seems like you generally have a skeptical tone about uh, Bitcoin and, and kind of the future for crypto there, uh, even with all the ETF money that's kind of flowing into that space. Yeah, so, so look, the problem with Bitcoin is, is that there's actually, unfortunately, a very fundamental flaw in the underlying rationale behind Bitcoin's creation, which is a peer-to-peer -peer payment system. 
Um, the adoption of a hard limit in terms of the number of Bitcoin that can ever be created actually, unfortunately, makes it really unsuitable for peer-to-peer -peer payment. We've actually seen somewhere around 15% of all Bitcoin that theoretically is ultimately going to become available has already been lost. And we can just mechanically think through those underlying dynamics of what happens if there's just some frictional loss, right? The equivalent of gold coins falling into the sea and never being recovered, right? That we've seen that historically in many monetary systems. So there's nothing surprising that's going on there. But that hard cap, that total inflexibility of the monetary supply actually has a fundamental flaw in it. It effectively doesn't allow any tradition, any reward for human ingenuity, right? The gold standard would respond to signals that says the gold price is rising. In other words, the coin value is falling or the dollar value is falling. That encourages people to go find more gold. Yeah. You don't have the equivalent in Bitcoin, right? There is no reward for human ingenuity. And what you actually get a reward for is exactly what they tell you to do, to hodl, right? Hold on for dear life. Holding money under your mattress may theoretically allow you to avoid losing it in other investments, but it's terrible for society. And so Bitcoin actually at its core is an anti-investment environment. Uh, I think that's a bad idea. And I think the data will ultimately show that, you know, this has been a speculative bubble like many that came before it. Just unfortunately, it's going to lead to far more social outrage because the narrative that's been built around is the only way this fails is if governments attack it. Yeah. I think that's a very caustic message to actually send out into the public. I do want to uh, touch briefly on your your take and the the you know, commentary and research you've done on passive versus active investing. Before I do shift to that, though. Uh, when you look at the the macro landscape for the you know the rest of 2024, is there anything that stands out to you as maybe a big opportunity, uh, and on the flip side, a big risk, something that you're you're mainly worried about at this point? Well, I mean, look, I think the the biggest risks that I remain concerned about are in that geopolitical framework. Uh, or let me rephrase that: one of the biggest risks I'm worried about is in the geopolitical framework, as it becomes increasingly apparent that China is being isolated, that China is being pushed away from its supply relationships. And ultimately, remember that China, with a falling population, needs to figure out how to source demand from overseas in order to keep growing and gaining wealth. Their, you know, candidly bad behavior on the political stage has created conditions under which fewer and fewer markets are available to them. And as a result, they could seek policies designed to open up those markets that include things like shooting bullets. Um, unfortunately, I think that's one of the biggest risks that we see. We saw that with Russia. We've seen that with yeah. um, outbreak of violence in the Middle East. These types of behaviors are um, understandable and somewhat predictable in these types of conditions, but they're ultimately you know, not good for anyone in, in the game. Uh, the second risk is actually tied to my work around passive investing. I highlight in part of the presentation that I'll give at the Money Show in May, is focused on this idea of what are the implications of the growth of effectively mindless strategies that operate off of the world's simplest algorithms. Did you give me cash? If so, then buy. Did you ask for cash? If so, then sell. That's all passive, quote unquote, investing is. And it's really important for investors and individuals to understand that the theory behind passive investing actually relies on passive investors never transacting. That's literally the definition in the literature is somebody who never transacts. Well, every time you send your paycheck to Vanguard, they are transacting. So they're not passive investors at all. They're actually active investors that operate off of rules that change behaviors in markets. And unfortunately, they've grown to the scale that we're now actually starting to really see that represented in market behavior. Well, yeah, and you know, I'm glad you you alluded to that. I think that that issue again, that's kind of how I first stumbled across your work is some of the commentary you had there, and I think it's very important for investors. Um, implications, I guess, if you were to give a sneak peek of what you might be talking about again in Miami and in California, um, you know, what what's the nugget of wisdom there that you pass on to people that are trying well, to navigate a market dominated by passive? Yeah, so I think that there's a couple of components, right? Remember again, like the rules of passive. Are, did you give me cash? If so, then buy. Did you ask for cash? If so, then sell. The giving of cash is a function of incomes. The asking of cash tends to be a function of asset levels. So when asset levels rise far more rapidly than incomes do, as we've seen within the U.S. stock markets, that raises the risk that withdrawals exceed contributions. And the only response to that is falling prices. 
We've seen a few examples of that historically. Now we're actually confronting the realities of a passive share that has grown large enough that the pressures of the retirement of the baby boomers, the retirements of the baby boomers are actually starting to show indications that it could lead to those flows becoming negative. And if that happens, the implications for markets are, you know, one, uncertain because we haven't seen that type of structural event happen before. But at least my models around how it behaves leads to significant pressure that makes U.S. markets look much more like the money exiting the Chinese stock market has experienced, which is a horrific bear market for years and years and years that fails to respond to almost any measure that's put forward. Right. We have to recognize that transactions are not passive investing. And so when you take that money out, you have to be prepared for the fact that you yourself are going to impact that market. And I think this is something that most people are not aware of. Another way to think about it, and I've used this recently, is remember the, the, the statements that we have from Web 2.0. If you're not putting in the work, if you're not making the payment, if you're not paying for the service, you're the product. Yep. And that's really true in passive investing. Vanguard and BlackRock are not making money on three basis point management fees. What they're actually making money on is the securities lending operations associated with the ownership of those assets. In other words, lending it out to hedge funds or others. They're keeping some of those proceeds for their own profits. You're getting a fraction of it returned in the case of something like Vanguard. That contributes to the very low cost and outperformance but at the same time, you're destroying the active manager community that it relies on, right? So this is an unsustainable process. People need to be aware of that and they need to start thinking about how do I protect myself against the generational features that we're about to see. Well, I think that's a great place to wrap up some great advice there. And, and I'm sure people are really gonna be interested to hear what you have to say in person. Um, if you're watching this again and you wanna learn more from Mike and dozens of other trading and investing experts, I do encourage you to check out the Investment Masters Symposium Miami. Uh, we're scheduled for April 10th to 12th at the Hyatt Regency downtown. Uh, and Mike's going to be speaking there with, with dozens of other top experts on investing, on trading, and topics that are going to help you uh, be a better investor this year. So, uh, Mike, thank you so much for your time again. Thank you all for watching.